Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Welcome back to Online Great Books Podcast. Dear listener, this is Brett. I am the producer. And today, Scott and Carl welcome Thomas Miris from Catholic Culture Podcast to this discussion of the 1920 book Art and Scholasticism by Jacques Maritain. Maritain was a very prolific French Catholic philosopher, active for a good portion of the 20th century. He's the author of over 60 books. And he's a man with many interesting associations, and that will be discussed in the show today as well. Scott is quite curious about this gentleman and the company that he kept in some periods of his life. This discussion is split into two parts, as is the usual around here. Today, an introduction to Miratan and this book, and next week's episode is a very substantial discussion that deals more with the contents of the book. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you for listening, and we'll get right to it. I'm Scott Hambrick. I'm Carl Shute. And today— I'm Thomas Miris. Oh, sh— <laughs> Hey, and that's Thomas Miris. And today on the Online Great Books Podcast, we're going to talk about uh, Jacques Maritain's Art and Scholasticism. Thomas is the host of the Catholic Culture Podcast, and what's the other one? I run a little. Uh, I run a little podcast network associated with a website called catholicculture.org. We have four shows, two of which I host. So I host the Catholic Culture Podcast, which is an interview show on a wide range of topics, about, but focusing on arts and culture, Catholic arts and culture. My co-host, uh, a show that you guys have both been on, um, Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast. Uh-huh. It's kind of like a, a complement to what you guys do on your two shows, this and, and music and ideas, except with a little bit of a religious slant. Wait, can I interrupt you for a sec? Sure. Because I can just hear off in podcast land a bunch of people saying, Oh, crap. Catholic stuff. Click. Oh. (laughs) Yeah, get lost. It is my tribe as well, and so I would not do that. But why would, say, a Protestant want to listen to us talk about a Catholic talk about art? Oh, sure. First of all, I'd just say, you know, because we were talking about the podcast, like, all of them deal with great books adjacent things. All of those four shows that I'm involved with, either as a producer or or a host— I mean, because uh, on the Catholic Culture Podcast, I'm very often dealing with universal philosophical issues. I'm doing dealing with great works of art. I'm dealing with, you know, Renaissance polyphony or just things that are universally considered great in, in Western culture. Not always in Western culture, but mostly in Western mm-hmm. culture. Uh, the film podcast, you know, we're our kind of hook for the show is we're going through the Vatican film list, which came out in 1995, although we're going off of it, too. But Virtually every film on that list is is universally canonized as one of the great films of world cinema over Got the it. past 100 yeah. years. And then the other two shows I produce, one of them is called Catholic Culture Audiobooks. And in that, we've actually recorded some of the authors on the great books list, uh, on, on Adler's list, uh, things by St. Augustine, for example, De Doctrina Christiana, uh, his his work on rhetoric and scriptural interpretation. That's That's on the great books list. That's going to be read in the online great books program at some point if people get that far so it's a lot of the church fathers it's a lot of saint john henry newman uh, another figure who shows up on there a lot is very important in educational theory i i can't imagine that mortimer adler was not familiar with his thinking on that he wrote a great book called certainly was the idea of a university then the other show we have way of the fathers is a history podcast about the fathers of the church so these are kind of like the great books specifically of Christianity of the first five or so centuries. Well, anybody who wants to know about Western history should be interested in that. And they don't have to listen to, of course. But, you know, yeah, of course, Protestants should be interested in that as well, because it's what the fir- the very earliest Christians uh, believed. I just wanted to be provocative on that. Well, oh, oh, you, you want to provoke me? Provoke you? Yeah, I got the I got the inflammatory answer. The Protestants should listen because they don't have a notion of aesthetics. Like accidentally, <laughs> Bach will step into yeah. beauty, but they really can't tell you what that is and why it is beautiful. They're like, oh, it's pretty, 
and that's kind of the answer. They don't. We have a tradition, right? We have a tradition. So do so do the Eastern uh, people. You know, the Eastern Catholics and the Orthodox. Yeah. Well, I was I was going to get there. You know, Maritan too has a connection to Adler. They were friends. Maritan really admired what Adler and Hutchins were doing, and they uh, were and at, at least Adler was in, definitely influenced by Maritan. Um, uh, I think one of the very last books on the Great Books list is by one of Maritan's early teachers, Henri Bergson, which is, this is before Maritan became Catholic, but he kind of introduced him to metaphysics and basically convinced him not to kill himself uh, for that reason. So there's a lot of connections to, you know, all the stuff that's in the wheelhouse of your podcast. But yeah, as far as the specific subject matter of art goes, this book, Art and Scholasticism, that we're going to discuss from 1920, this book was received by quite a number of artists who were not uh, practicing Catholics uh, or even practicing Christians. I mean, this is quite an influential book. This is back in the day when there were more Catholic thinkers, serious Catholic thinkers in the public square, and I, I guess I should say more serious thinkers in the public square, period. But, uh, you know, people who read this book would include T.S. Eliot, Alan Tate, Flannery O'Connor, Francois Mariak, Igor Stravinsky, and Maritain himself, in my opinion, gets art better than any other philosopher who came before him in the Western tradition. And I think a big reason for that, aside from, you know, being a Thomist and his brilliance and uh, all of the all of the gifts that he brought to that, is that he hung out with artists all the time and he learned from them. I mean, he hung out with guys like Eric Satie, Jean Cocteau, novelists like Bernanos, Marc Chagall, Georges Rouault, all these great French artists of kind of like the inter-World War uh, between World War One, World War Two period, his wife was also a poet, so he hung out with artists and learned from them, and also was just a student of the whole artistic tradition, and not just Western art either. It's something that he's interested in, in more than just an abstract way. I mean, like if you, if you look at a lot of earlier Western philosophy on, uh, say, music. You know, they're interested in like the music of the spheres or these kind of like abstracted notions that are not necessarily that much about the concrete sort of the way a musician thinks, the way that his mind works, the virtue of being a musician. And these are things that you can find implicitly in the thought of Thomas Aquinas and the other scholastics who he's drawing from. But he's kind of one of the first people to really like elucidate this whole thought on art from just a few little things scattered here and there throughout Aquinas, who doesn't really have a great deal of interest in art for its own sake in the sense of the fine arts. Um, but there's a lot of things to draw on that you can really get like a whole body of work from. Right. Okay. And I want to add also for our non-Catholic listeners, I hope they're still listening. Uh, this, I remember uh, I was reading John Meyendorf, who's an Orthodox, I believe he's a priest, Orthodox priest. Uh, and he was writing about Catholic thought on marriage and family. And he said, just because it's Catholic doesn't mean it's wrong. So, <laughs> yeah, well, that is also true. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's an amazing book. There's a ton to draw on it. The, the, this, this book, it's really an essay and it's about 60 pages or so in my edition, but it really covers a lot of ground you could really you could draw a heck of a lot from it. And a lot of artists have drawn a lot of practical uh, things from it over the years. Yeah, y'all are making too much of this Catholic stuff. <laughs> I feel like you're protesting too much or asking me to protest no. too much or something. But um, no. you know, yeah, it's interesting. I, I mentioned he was part of the kind of the public conversation, and and you know, some of that might might not you know endear him to Scott, uh, but. Um, he, I, for example, if, if anybody's ever been to Coit Tower in San Francisco, they've got a mural on the inside of the tower, which is kind of a scene of people in a library. And you can see like different authors' names on the spine of the spines of the books. And one of them I saw Maritan's name on the spine of one of the books in this mural. And so I was like, oh, okay. So like this is a guy who was at one point known and respected. I feel like I even heard Leonard Bernstein read Art and Scholasticism. I could be misremembering. I mean, he also is very influential outside of that. I mean, the guy helped draft the UN's Universal De Declaration of Human Rights. You're not winning me over here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I may be winning some of the audience. Well, they need to, to turn off. To see, like, this is more than like a sectarian writer. Yeah. Well, Maritan, he's trying to approach aesthetics here from a scholastic 
with a, with a scholastic approach, which is really sort of an Aristotelian approach. If you like your Aristotle, right. you will recognize that here and you will appreciate that. This guy has put together a very orderly and um, complete treatment of his theory of aesthetics. I think here with this little short thing, art and aesthetics, I, I've got mm-hmm. the uh, Clooney Media copy nice. here in my in my hot little hand. That's what Carl has. Is that what you've got? Yeah, great Thomas? publisher. Is that what you have? Make sure we're all on the same um, page. I have an old out of print edition that my sister gave me that she used in college years and years ago. Uh, this was my second time reading this. My first time was about 12 years ago when I was in so, college. So that, that's the one we're cracking here. You can find it online too at the Notre Dame's uh, Notre Dame's Maritan Center online. It's a different translation than uh, I think the Clooney Media and the one that I have is by J.F. Scanlon and theirs is by someone else. But really, can you read a book on aesthetics <sighs> in a browser? Right. <laughs> Yeah, well. So he's got this orderly approach and uh, the scholastic approach, this Thomas approach to to aesthetics that is super dry, uh, absolutely zero fun to read for me, but good. <laughs> you know, he does a good job, and I, I in in the pages of this of this, I had I had no problems. And then I see all of these other things that he has these other associations in his life that I find disgusting and repugnant and I can't square it all. Like he's a great friend of Saul Alinsky, who I think is one of the lesser Satans. He's a friend of the UN, which is maybe one of the greater ones. I don't get it. And I can't even conceive of an explanation that I could hear that would make me say, Oh, I understand now. Uh huh. (laughs) Sure. Well, as far as the UN goes, I, I I can't speak on that too much. Other than I think that there was a lot more optimism in the like the 1950s about that sort of thing than would be justifiable in somebody with Maritan's beliefs now. But, but how how could a Thomas ever look at that and say, okay, this jives? You know mm-hmm. how how could somebody that had read Aristotle's Politics and was a Thomas go to the UN building in New York City and say, okay, I'll help you guys? I, I don't get it. Uh huh. Yeah, it's hard for me to respond to that because uh, I don't really know much about what the UN was back then. So, uh, you know, I'm not on the historical stuff. I know more about the Alinsky thing. That's something that I've looked into because it freaked me out a little bit when I found out about it. But at that time, I'd already read so much of Maritan and already like had so much respect for him that it was it was less like, oh, this is turning me off from this guy altogether. And more like, like you said, like, okay, how do I square this? What's the deal with that? One of the things with Alinsky is, well, first of all, Maritan was not a political conservative uh, for much of his life. He was kind of radical by disposition, but earlier in his life that that took it t- took sort of right wing forms. He the other thing is, you know, one of the other things is Maritan was just friends with everyone, and he was trying to convert everyone. So uh, he converted a lot of those French artists in the not a lot, but a few of those French artists in the sort of interwar period. He he brought. Uh, Eric Satie back to the church on his deathbed. Um, So he was friends with other people, with people and wanted to see the best in people. I think that he was a bit politically naive. He really loved uh, American democracy. And um, (laughs) you're not winning me, man. Was. Yeah. (laughs) Well, yeah, but I think I this is why I didn't want to talk about this at the beginning, because it's like it's a separate issue from the art. But since we're talking about it, you know, um, Alinsky was a guy at one point who was able to convince a lot of people that he was just, you know, a lovably provocative dude who loved democracy and the poor. And he also made a special practice of duping Catholics, I have to I have to say, unfortunately, one of the things is that, you know, rules for radicals is not written until the year before Maritan's death. He met him much earlier. He encouraged him to write the 1946 book Reveal for Radicals. And if I'm pronouncing yeah. that word correctly, Re- Reveille. Rev- yeah. And uh, Rules for Radicals is written in 71. And he criticizes Rules for Radicals. The last letter we have between them is Maritan's critique of Rules for Radicals. I think he's a bit optimistic about Alinsky's basic intentions, but he del- he, he makes clear that he disagrees with him fundament- uh, fundamentally on a lot of phys- philosophical issues. From what I understand, not having read it, the, the earlier book is about methods of community organizing but, organizing, but it's not about philosophical principles. Maritan, from what I've read, seems to have thought the vision of community organizing uh, laid out in that book really reflected kind of the idea, traditional idea of subsidiarity and the function of intermediary institutions between the state and the individual, which is something he was concerned about. 
and I, I don't know that much more about it. I would say uh, he either thought Alinsky's motives were different than they were, or Alinsky's motives changed over the years um, because he is quite critical of rules. Or he agreed with him because he's also like a Rawlsian consensus ethics guy. Is he? What ethics? Consensus ethics. Yeah, he, he also shares some some views with Rawls. Maritan. The, I haven't encountered that. I don't, I'm not a Maritan expert. I remember uh, a comment Edith Stein says that he said, the suggestion that he made about uh, original sin and ethics. Well, this is probably 1930, though. Uh, that if original sin is true, you can't do ethics without understanding it. Any ethics that you do is going to fail. Yeah. I would be, I would be seriously doubt. Like Maritain is quite critical of a lot of modern philosophy, and and without having read those works, which I don't think either of us has, I, I would be really hesitant to make a statement like that um, based on like somebody else's summary or, uh, or something like that. I mean, the other thing is that Maritain's views change over the years, particularly in politics. This is quite early for him. This is, I think, the first major thing he wrote about art, for example. This is So this is the good Maritain before um, the bad Maritain. Well, look at this. You know, one of one of the things it, it may be the case. I don't think he became a bad person, but it may be the case from what I understand. For example, his work uh, in the past couple of years on political philosophy and sort of democratic pluralism and religious liberty and stuff has has been, I would say, reevaluated in certain Catholic intellectual uh, sectors, particularly by the integralist uh, types uh, in the past couple of years. I'm very sympathetic with their critique. I think sometimes they they're a little harsh on him, but. Um, uh, the one book of his that I've read on politics is an early one called the, the primacy of the spiritual or the things that are not Caesars. And that book is not at all what you would, I forget the year of that. I think it's in the twenties and that book is not at all what you would expect from the criticisms of his later writings on political philosophy by, uh, sort of more right-wing, uh, Catholics. So, I don't think that we should let whatever reservations we might have about other stuff later on affect our views of this sure. particular book. Again, I mean, he doesn't even meet Alinsky for like 20, 25 years. I forget, sure. 40s or 50s. Maritain's active from, you know, at least like the 1910s through the early 70s as a philosopher. And he writes about just about every branch of philosophy there is. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I have a high opinion of him, of him as a person. Um, and I, I know enough about him not to doubt his good intentions. And, uh, I also know enough about his philosophy and have read enough of it, um, and excerpts from some of his work on, on other topics than art to know that this was like a really profound thinker, certainly a disciple of Thomas Aquinas. Well, let's get to some of the thinking now that we've, we've punched him a bit. He's got this theory of art. On the one hand, I, you know, I think it's probably correct. On the other hand, I, I, I wonder you know, how could it be effective for the audience? But one of the big things that for anybody nowadays is the idea that art is a making yeah. versus, uh, say, intellectual virtues, which are about, you know, understanding. Art is about doing. So he makes this series of distinctions and he starts with the, the speculative versus the practical intellect. And then within the practical intellect, he divides between making and doing. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a making and... Uh, I like the, I found very productive the thought that all making is art. So right. plumbing, for example, is art. Yeah, ship building. Yeah, landscaping is art. All making. Yeah. And this is because he started, this is partially because he is starting with this scholastic definition, was not which was not particularly concerned with the distinction between the art of the craftsman or the artisan and what we would now call the fine arts. And he finds that to be a productive way of starting the discussion before you get into kind of the beauty aspect of it. Um, and I think, I think he does get a lot of fruit from that way of formulating it. I was thinking about it. So we, we mentioned Bach before, um, and I've done a little work in church music and I think you have as well, Thomas. Uh, mm -hmm. and just I just, little, yeah, don't you do a lot of it? Or... Uh, no, most of my work has been secular. I've I've only done a, a couple of church gigs here and there. Okay. I took organ lessons for a few months, but dropped it. <laughs> I'm with... trained as a jazz pianist. So you have to play with your feet. Be... That's... Oh yeah, that's hard, man. It's like playing the drums. Shoes. You know, uh, that's weird. So you know, I was thrust into a position as a, a choir director for a while in a church, 
where everything is sung. There's no instruments. And, uh, you know, you just got to produce music and it doesn't matter. There's a silence and that's bad. So we have to produce music all the time. And so it's kind of like plumbing. You have to stop the leak. It's a making. It's very much a making. And I, I just always think of like of Bach that way that he's got, um, I guess he worked in the cathedral, which whatever town he worked in, the big Lutheran church in Dresden, I think, wherever he was. And uh, he's got to produce music all the time. And of course, he does it very, very well. And him having the habitus mm. of music much more than I do. So we have to talk about that, too. Uh, when he's doing the plumbing, lots of the time it's brilliant. Mm-hmm. Whereas when I'm doing the plumbing, it wasn't brilliant so often. I did one or two nice things, but... Mostly it was, you know, plugging the leaks. But I think we have this image of art that he talks about, too, as we have this romantic image of art where, you know, you you go off into solitude and you do a lot of drugs and you reach deep down into the darkness of your soul and you come up with some new original uh, establishment of meaning. And that's not what it is. It's it's practical. It's making something. What I love, one thing I love about Maritan is is that I think that he gets what's true in that, but situates it within this much more sober, scholastic approach. And in his later books, you know, this kind of lays out a lot of things that he's going to explore in more detail. So he has a, a series of talks called "The Responsibility of the Artist," which are just about the subject matter of that last chapter on art and prudence, art and morality. Then he has a later book, probably his longest book on art is Creative Intuition and Art and Poetry. And then there he's getting into like what sets, you know, the fine arts apart. Like what is it that the artist has in him that allows him to bring forth beauty in a work of art? But uh, yeah, in this book, he's especially focusing on this sober scholastic framework. Um, We should probably say for clarity's sake too, that um, when he says art... He is talking not about a thing, uh, an object made by an artist. He is talking about the virtue or the habit of art. Um, so it might get confusing. So we can we can talk about a work of art, you know, the object of art, the thing made by the artist. But he's talking about the habit of art when he simply says art. So yeah, it's a virtue of the spe- of sorry, not the speculative. It's a virtue of the practical intellect, and that's kind of what the book is about. And the reason he makes this distinction between doing and making is because it's very important to understand the formal end of any given virtue, right? So the, the purpose of the virtue um, to which it tends, the end of art as such, formally speaking, is the good of the thing made. So it's not actually the good of man. It's not the good of the artist. The virtue of art in itself, taken formally, aims towards, uh, uh, actually, there's this scholastic phrase, rectia, recta ratio factibilium, and Maritan translates this as the undeviating determination of work to be done, <laughs> which I mm-hmm. kind of like. I like that that undeviating, um, and that kind of gets to the fact that like this is a virtue, yeah. and, it's, and it's infallible as, insofar as it's uh, put into use. Yeah, so... Uh, we've made a distinction we ought to clear up a little bit. Prudence, so there, this is a quote from Maritain, I think it's on page 17 of ours. Uh, prudence operates for the good of the of the worker. Art operates for the good of the work done. Mm-hmm. So prudence is the virtue of knowing what exactly to do in a particular situation. Yeah. And it's for you. It's so that you don't sin, so that you don't do wrong things. Yeah. Uh, art is for the sake of the work done. I have a book of early church fathers on music on cantors. And one of the quotes in there is like this admonition to the cantor, which used to be an ordained role. You, know, you you sing for the glory of God while your your life leads you down to hell, you know? And that's possible to do. Yeah. It's, that's one of the things yeah. in, in the responsibility of the artist. He has a line where he says, Oscar Wilde was just being a good Thomas when he said, a man's being a poisoner is nothing against his prose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, poor Oscar. Oh, yeah, he's pretty harsh on Oscar Wilde in a, a number of his books, actually. Well, rightly. The scholastics have to get all the metaphysics right. They have to know what everything is in its mm-hmm. finest detail before they can do anything else. So right. 
in my book, this is 80 pages. This, this essay is 80 pages. 40 of it is just what, what the metaphysics of what, what is art. Yeah. That can be dry and something that maybe you don't want to read for sport or fun. But, man, it's so important. He says, the error in the aesthetics of modern philosophy, which considering under art the fine arts only and dealing with the beautiful only as it concerns art, runs the risk of spoiling the proper conception of both, of both fine arts and beauty, you know. We had online great books. We've got all kinds of people that are thoughtful and like to do interesting things and are interested in beauty. And we have a channel called OGB Art, and people do stuff. And... A lot of these people don't want to do anything because they don't think it'll be beautiful enough. Or they do things that are interesting, but they don't conceive it to be art. Like make ah. a, a really nice bench to put in the mudroom to sit on when you change your shoes. Yeah. The modern conception of art has disqualified, in people's own minds, has disqualified them from doing fine things. And that is disgusting. Yeah. It is a huge problem, and it hurts most of us. He says, uh, there, right at the end of that first chapter, we need this better understanding of art. And then he says, at a time when the necessity of escaping from the vast intellectual confusion bequeathed to us by the 19th century and finding once more the spiritual conditions of work, which she shall be honest, is everywhere felt. You know, he, he thinks if we really know yeah. what art is, that we'll be more connected to honest work and that that, and that will be a refuge from this intellectual confusion, this metaphysical disgustingness that, around us. And we see it all yeah. the time. Like, Oh, listen, son, you don't, you know, you need to go to college. You know, you need to, uh, you know, you need a, a job where you're clean, a white collar job. Cause that's respectful, respectable. And that's what good people do. <laughs> so, you know, if you do right. stuff where you get dirty or actually use your body to work, that's 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 not genteel. That's not respectable. That's base. You know, right. they would rather, you know, people in the United States, by and large, would rather their kid sit in a cubicle, have the HR mammy hit him on the head and finish the TPS reports than <laughs> have a kid that uh, that soldered good joints and was a good plumber. And Maritan would have none of that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, one of the wonderful things about this philosopher we, we just read is that he, very much like Aquinas, is not willing to let a drop of truth be lost. So he's going to he's going to actually give the, the artisan his dignity while maintaining that there's a lot of truth to this greater self-consciousness of the fine arts that's developed over the centuries, that they are different, they are something higher. So, so he can say, uh, he, he, can, he can emphasize that art, even the art of the shipbuilder or the benchmaker or whatever, is fundamentally an intellectual virtue. It's not actually manual labor. The manual labor is something intr extrinsic, he says, to the virtue of art. And of course, that's actually a pretty important point for artists to understand too, right? It's not just about your chops. Right. He can also go go on and later say that the fine arts are to art as a whole, as you know, man is to the gen the genus of animal. And yeah. so he's able to give both their proper dignity, and and by ele elevating the fine arts, he's, he doesn't do it in such a way that degrades the art of the artist, and it's like they're both lifted up in this vision. Because he's Aristotelian, he, he, he knows the four causes, right? So he right. says, um, if you're a yeah. shaker and you're building a chair, the final cause of your work is that someone may be seated well. <laughs> you know, but, but if it's yeah. fine art, the final cause is, is just beauty, which shares a root with the beatific, right? It, yeah. it's, it's, there's godliness in it. So he, he's able to elevate the fine arts mm. without deucing on the things that make the toilets flush. He holds them both in esteem, and he's able to hold them both in esteem without, without denigrating the other. You know, I, I know a lot of rednecks that are yeah. welders and make beautiful welds and build things and do things with their hands, and they hate the fine arts. Right. It's it's not it's not just the yeah. art nerd that went to the art school who thinks less of the plumber, but but I know some plumbers that don't think much of the fine arts either, right? Because it doesn't have that practical right. end. They're like, What good is this? 
they've been clove these things have been cloven apart so much and like it's you could almost make an analogy to like music how like classical music needs to draw on folk music and and folk music needs to be you know draw on classical music in some sense it needs to be breathe the same air um culturally so that it can be elevated and of course they're both i would say they're both arts of the beautiful in the, in this case but it's just, you know it's an analogy um and so when you when you um base this the, the 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 dignity of the fine arts on something that's actually not the source of its dignity which would be like something about you know the, your subconscious or or its impracticality in fact is like is one of these quote unquote good things about it now yeah that is actually one of the Maritanists good things about it, right? It's like, it isn't a tool. It isn't a practical thing. Yeah. It is a thing of beauty. And for him, but he makes yeah. a distinction. But he makes distinctions in order to unite, which is the classic Thomas thing. It's like at the end, he actually brings it back and shows how art fits into the goods of human life and the goods of the common good and society and the church. You know, his last couple of chapters are on art and religion, you know, art and morality. So he's keeping the distinction. He's keeping the proper end of art while uniting it in human subject with all these human goods and the final end of man, you know. Um, so it's it's really beautifully done, and so many others have strayed on one side or the other. I certainly want wouldn't want to, like, attempt to go back to, like, artists seeing themselves only as craftsmen. Huh. I kind of would. You can't un open that door once it's been opened, you know, hmm. because there's some real truth there. There's a spirit, there's like a, there's a deeper spiritual thing going on here where if you see yourself merely as a, someone who's making something for practical use, uh, we would lose this, you know, instrumental music, for example. Would uh, Michelangelo with his hammer and chisel, do you think that he, he would say that he was a craftsman or an artist? I, I'm not sure. It seems like there was a little bit more. It seems like a lot of the self consciousness of art artists came in in the Renaissance. So by his point, you might get to that. He kind of slams Da Vinci a little bit, and I think it's in a footnote. He, he doesn't slam him, but he says like, you know, he was a great artist, but he makes some truly embarrassing justifications for his art, like, oh, a monkey saw this monkey that was painted on a wall and thought it was another real monkey and started dancing around and playing with it, as though that like gives art its dignity. It's like totally, it's ridiculous, you know. Uh, but of course, he doesn't say that Da Vinci wasn't an artist because he said that. It's just that you know so his thinking was maybe not quite right uh, as to what the value of what he was doing was at, at every point. He has this notion of beauty as a beast, which I, I thought was pretty productive. Uh, for me, this is on page twenty-four. He's talking about the Middle Ages, uh, those terrible Middle Ages. More beautiful things were then created. And there was less self-worship. The blessed humility in which the artist was situated exalted his strength and his freedom. The Renaissance was destined to drive the artist mad and make him the most miserable of men at the very moment when the world was to become less habitable for him. Mm. By revealing to him his own grandeur and letting loose upon him the wild beast beauty, which faith kept enchanted and led after it obedient with a gossamer thread for a leash. See, you know, yes, Meriton can be dry when he says his most scholastic, but he can also be quite poetic, especially, I would say, in the later parts of the uh, the essay. So the wild beast beauty. So, all right. So I was listening to Shostakovich today. I'm sorry. It is about as modern as I get. And there's there's a bit of the wild beast beauty in him. It's about as far as I want to go away from tonality. The restraint makes it better. You know, and so I was thinking about this book and it was part of my frustration with it because art, especially the fine arts is for the sake of beauty. It's for the sake of delight, but it's a beauty that, because beauty is convertible with being for a scholastic. It's a beauty that's another word for the good and for, for that which is. And so in order to do it right, you have to have, it seems to me, some sort of metaphysical intuition into beauty itself. Yeah. And so, and then I got frustrated with the book and I thought I'm going to yell at Thomas for this because what good would this book be to anybody nowadays who, who does not already share uh, something like a medieval metaphysics. And then I thought, <laughs> so this is me arguing with myself. And then I thought, well, maybe we'd need some kind of boot camp. Okay. A mm -hmm. boot camp for artists. 
where you have to get them the proper metaphysics. Well, my friends just started one, actually. Oh, yeah? How do they do it? Because I have my ideas. Tell me what your friends do, and I'll see, see what my, um, my camp would well, be Well, first like. of all, let me say that, I mean, Maritain did, this book did, in fact, succeed in introducing a number of artists of the 20th century to these ideas who weren't pri previously familiar to them. So, like, this actually gave them that introduction and that framework. But... um yeah, so my friends um, who I've had on my podcast a bunch of times, James Matthew Wilson, who is a poet and a philosopher, for, right, one of the foremost writers in formal verse in the country. My friend Joshua Wren, who is a fiction writer and a poet and essayist and runs a small Catholic publisher called Wise Blood Books. They just started an MFA program at the University of St. Thomas in Houston, and they just started their first year. And it, it, it has the Catholic intellectual uh, tradition component of Aquinas, et cetera, Aristotle, you know, the classical thought on, on art and beauty. And, uh, then it has a, pra a practical workshop component. So it's kind of the first of its kind to have both to be really distinctively ca in the Catholic intellectual tradition, but also to be run by people who are, you know, experienced practitioners of the arts. So it has a poetry and a, a fiction, uh, component. I don't know that much else about it. I think they have about 40 people in the first class. And it's non-residential, so you can do it online. All right. So so I would do it differently. That's very good. It's kind of like an apprenticeship, which Maritan talks about, that art needs to be done yeah. on the apprentice model, where you just start doing it under a master. Um, I think that's very good. But I think for a lot, a lot of folks, I think they need to be grounded in reality. So here's my idea. You take them out to the farm, and you have them plant stuff and you have them tend it, and you have them deal with livestock, uh, and get them really grounded in reality. Because it's very easy, if you're a city dweller, um, if you're a modern person who gets all your stuff from a grocery store, it's very easy to get distance from nature. And he has some things in here about... he. I thought his comments on imitative art were interesting as well, that he's not a huge fan of it, uh, but that you need to look at nature as a teacher to you on how to do your art. And I thought it would be very good to to have people actually have worked on the other continuum of art. So if art is making, all making, before you get to the fine arts, which are making simply for the joy of apprehension and beauty, you got to be able to make stuff and realize that things have their, their, their thingness. Like, yeah. Well, we could all stand to be more in touch with reality than not. <laughs> I think that would help yeah. a lot of things. Um, I mean, I've been listening. Uh, I'm going to plug another podcast. Uh, I've been listening to the Farmstead Meatsmith, which is great fun. They it's I, I think they're Catholic. I'm sure they're Catholic. Husband and wife. And he's a, how would you describe him? Well, he's a butcher and slaughter guy. But he's talking about, <laughs> yeah, he's talking about the talus of the pig. You know, how does this pig best express its being? Well, it says bacon, you know, and, and you have to do it the right way. And there are rules on how you, you kill a pig. And if you do it wrong, you're going to make more pain for the pig. And I'm thinking this guy is in touch with the ontological mystery every day. And that makes me sad about the, the craftsmen that think that what they're doing is not art, this gap between the crafts and, and the fine arts. I, I don't think it should be there because you're doing the same thing. Well, I wouldn't say that there should be no distinction uh, between the two, but it should be more porous. I mean, it should be like there's a the beauty should be allowed to go both ways, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like it's less that it should be less that the the crafts are not beautiful and more that that's not their primary purpose, right? Like aesthetic beauty is not the primary purpose of the the craft of the welder, yeah. um, but uh, it shouldn't be that he's not making beautiful things, you know, according to his tradition. Well, and if you walk through an old building in Europe, a medieval building, you know, right. I used to, um, when I was in Europe, I would go to the, the cathedral in every town I went in and climb the tower. And you look at this building, everything in it is, is beautiful. Yeah. Cause every stone cutter, every Mason, I guess, every, every person making a window is making something beautiful. Even though, so the window, like all the stained glass windows, they're there to keep out the wind and the rain. That's what windows are for and to let in the light. But we're not just going to let it, we're just not going to do it. We're going to do it right. uh, with a focus on beauty. With style. 
Yeah, style points count. I, so when he said that uh, more beautiful things were then created and there was less self-worship, and that's another thing. You don't know who any of those artisans were. That's right. Because they don't sign it. Yeah. And not everybody has to be a genius, too, in, into that system, especially when you have that kind of apprenticeship. And when I say genius, I mean basically someone with a gift from God, because I do believe that as far as the arts of the beautiful are concerned, you either have the gift or you don't. But I also believe that all human beings are artists in some sense, which is what Maritans kind of starts yeah, out if with. If you participate in making, which is actually touching yeah. things and doing things, but it's also thinking. He talks about intellectual arts, so it's, it's also thinking. And Logic. the physical making yeah. cannot be separated from the intellectual making. I just sent you guys a picture of the greenhouse right. I'm building. This thing didn't exist. Yeah, I just I just saw it really clearly nice. until I started building it, and there were no drawings. I, I made drawings for it. Um, I have spent more time thinking about it than I have putting it together. And while I put it together, I find that I, I mean I've had to revise my drawings; <laughs> they they weren't right, and and make changes along the way. There is way more thinking going on than fastening and cutting, and assembling. Uh, it's been very interesting. And while I'm doing that, I can't do anything else. I'm still on page 11. You guys keep like trying to get up in the 20s. And so. I'm trying to slow down a little bit, too. Um, but I'm also trying to address whatever comments come my, come my way. So to speak to what you were just saying, so this is, Scott, this is early in, this is probably in chapter two. Um, I'm not sure. It's in my notes. Uh, he's, virtue involves what, you know, in this tradition, this intellectual tradition is called a connaturality a likeness or a sort of interior unity between the soul and the object at which any given virtue aims. So he says, through the presence in them of the virtue of art, they are in a way, they are in a way their work before they create it. To be able to form it, they have conformed to it. So that speaks to the kind of the intellectual virtue, and it's not even just like something you're um, sort of reasoning out in your mind. Actually, if you have the virtue of art, there is an intuitive aspect to it, even um, even when you're not dealing with the fine arts, um, where your your mind is contemplating the thing that it's going to create, and, and your mind is sort of shaped and conformed to that form, and then that enables you to make that form if the sort of physical obstacles to doing so are removed which he, is how he kind of describes technique. Like it's just the removal of obstacles to the operation of the virtue of art. I have to read a quote here because, like you said, he can be poetic, Thomas. Here on 11, he says, just kind of jump in the middle here, hence the despotic and all-absorbing power of art, and also its astonishing power for soothing. It frees from every human care. It establishes the artifacts, artist or artisan in a world apart, cloistered, defined and absolute in which to devote all the strength and intelligence of his manhood to the service of the thing which he is making. This is true of every art. The ennui of living and willing ceases on the threshold of every studio or workshop. Hmm. Yeah, it's very moving, isn't it? Yeah. He, he, and this is a guy, you could tell this is a guy who hung out with artists. He hung out with people who do this. Um, and, and he's able to understand them from the inside to some extent. And he, and he extends that to, uh, yeah, like he says, the artifacts there. Ennui, you know, that's like, uh, a boredom from pointlessness, right? What, what does ennui mean, Carl? Oh, heck. I, uh, listless. I don't know, but boredom caused it. I mean, maybe sloth. It's like this, the uh, sadness at good things. It's boredom because you're a degenerate. The OED says, uh, the feeling of... <laughs> so, French boredom. French, right. Uh, it says, the feeling of mental weariness and dissatisfaction produced by want of occupation or by lack of interest in present surroundings or employments. I'll buy that. Not to do on the French too much, because the French Thomists are pretty much the best Thomists of the 20th century. I mean, like, I, I'm just continually blown away. And like, what, what was in the water not fluoride. in the first half of the 20th century? Not fluoride. Uh, with some of these... Maybe it's uh, what was wasn't in the water. <laughs> Not fluoride. Yeah, it was sparkling. I'm, I'm sure it was sparkling water. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, guys like him, Gilson, uh, Sertelan, Joy almost suggested we discuss uh, here. Garigou Lagrange, who is one of Maritain's mentor, great theologian. Some people say the greatest theologian, Thomas theologian of the 20th century. This book is practical. I'm, I'm pounding on it. 
He says the ennui of living willing ceases on the threshold of the <laughs> workshop. I think it's a nice sound. Most of the people in the Western world are experiencing devastating ennui right now. We've been locked up, not listened mm-hmm. to, whatever. Yeah. Uh, 2020 and 2021 have not been easy. They have not been uh, years when people felt uh, agency and uh, Mm -hmm. life bubbling out of them. (laughs) And he says right here, the ennui of living and willing ceases on the threshold of every studio or workshop. And I, I know that's true. I know that's true. Like I get up, I've got a greenhouse to build. I go down there and do it. I'm effective. I can act. I know who I am. I know what the world is. I know how we fit together while I'm doing that. It, it's wonderful. So if you're having that thing, if you're experiencing that, do something. Do something. Build a ship in a bottle for crying out loud. Yeah. It's also, it's it's partially because it connects us with the world, but it's also partially because it's what we were made to be. I mean, we are made in the image of, you know, the craftsman. And so, so there is a certain like, peace that you get in your soul when you're doing what you were made to do, even if it's just sort of broadly as a human being, as opposed to like, this is my specific vocation. You're fulfilling your nature in some way. And that that's kind of what peace is well, <laughs> by definition. How sad would spiders be if they couldn't make webs? Oh my gosh. That is like the most depressing <laughs> thought ever. <laughs> Build something. That was, that's heavy, man. <laughs> <laughs> Um, maybe we should talk. Do you think you, sh- should we move on to beauty we now? Gotta, should we add beauty we into hop, the discussion since first. We, uh, we've talked a lot about the craft? I wanted to. Yeah, yeah, we got to do that. Whatever a habitus what? is. Oh right, yeah. Which I wish I had. Are you sure? You know, this is the thing that Miles Davis had, but I don't. Uh, not very much. You might have some that he didn't, though, yeah. <laughs> Carl. <laughs> But, you know, you can practice trumpet you know, for years and years and years, and you can learn how to play jazz and technically be within the, the chord structures, and so you don't embarrass yourself at the jam session. But then, you know, the real guys show up, and mm-hmm. there's something sparkly about it, and I don't don't know how to get that. The guy that shows up with the habitus, he doesn't just know how to play. He knows what to play. Yeah. I think hobby two. It's tough. Uh, chapter yeah. four. Yes, it's it's tough. You know, I I think that there's more. What what Carl is talking about here. I think there's more actually than just the virtue because I think the virtue actually attains to things that transcend the virtue. If you have the sort of artistic gift that you're talking about in in a Miles Davis. So I think that like, I mean a, a virtue technically is accessible to anybody who works at it, right? But I think there are certain things, there are certain like sort of what Maritan is going to describe as creative intuition that some people are especially gifted with. But yeah, there is a certainty. I mean, you, you, you Scott, you said they don't they know what to play. Well, that kind of fits in with um, what Maritan says: a virtue is is undeviating from its object. I love that he uses that word. It's something that's flexible. And it's spontaneous. It's not a set of rules to be imposed by outside, uh, from outside. Least of all in the fine arts is it a set of rules to be imposed from the outside. Um, it is actually something that, it, it, by that naturality, that likeness with the object at what which the work aims, it's actually something that is generating itself. The, the, the rules of the work are generating themselves spontaneously according to the circ- the needs of the circumstances. And according to the, the specific work to be made. Um, so, and it does so in an undeviating way. So other things might get in the way, but Charlie Parker, he has the virtue of art and the fact that he's a heroin addict and might not be able to uh, move his fingers, you know, cause he's so messed up uh, at a certain day uh, doesn't mean he doesn't have the virtue of art because that intellectual virtue that is, undeviating from its object as far as his soul is concerned. So the art then, this is going to, might be inside baseball stuff, but then art cannot be a moral virtue. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of where he starts or, or kind of near the beginning of the book in the second chapter. Yeah. Art's not a moral virtue. Everybody should be able to acquire the moral virtues, but not everybody can acquire the habitus of art. 
I don't know if that follows. I think all virtues that are natural virtues are by definition obtainable if they're intellectual virtues. But that doesn't mean that you have the sort of the gift of the f- the fine artist or whatever. But but that's a separate. I see that as being a separate a, a thing that the virtue works with, and the virtue is used as a as, is kind of used by inspiration or what have you. Um, I think the virtue itself. I think from reading this book that at least Maritan thinks that anybody can develop the virtue, but he also says well, it's for the few because only a few actually do develop it. Because in towards the end, he has a chapter on the rules of art, and he says rules, anybody can apply a set of rules, but only a few, anybody can have a method, but only a few have a virtue. If I'm tone deaf and I go to the Thomas Mears School of uh, Practical Piano and become an apprentice, you know, how good can I get? Yeah, I don't know. Can can tone deaf people be taught to? Uh, I would say that's. I would say all the uh, notes yeah, on your you piano a, sound the same to me. I think. I think that. I think that's true. Maritan definitely would see that as a. Um, I think he would definitely see that as an an external obstacle. Like that's a physical, maybe a physical problem or something. Mm-hmm. But that might prevent you from actually developing the virtue. But I think that maybe defect, maybe sort of like abnormal defects aside, I think like. It seems to me, and again, I'm not an expert in scholasticism, but but it seems to me that according to this idea of virtue, it is accessible to anyone, even the non-moral virtues, if you if you practice. It is accessible to man, the rational animal, though some, through accidents, have deficiencies that prevent them from developing certain virtues or habitus. Oh, nice. Okay, I think's what Thomas would say. How about that? Wait, did you? Were you? I thought you were see, quoting. Someone. No, I mean, not, I mean, that's the thing, right? You know, you have. So, so. The, see, the the Oklahoma Thomists are the greatest Thomists of the twenty first right. century. No, well, well, man is the rational animal, right? And um, we pursue this beatific vision in all things we do, and he has certain characteristics. But not every man has all of those characteristics in their fullest extent. And and he talks about you know, we, certain individuals may have deficiencies, but that doesn't make them less people. Um, it just makes some of these things harder for them. And I still want to hammer on ha- habitus. I think this is super important. Um, it, yeah. it sounds like habit, listener, but it ain't habit, right? I'm, I'm going to read the first, I don't know, chunk here of section four. It's called Art and Intellectual Virtue. I read it several times, and I'm still not sure I know what a habitus is. Hmm. He says, to summarize now the teaching of the schools concerning art in general, considered in the artist or the artisan and as peculiar to him. Reads like a scholastic, doesn't it? One, (laughs) art is before all intellectual, and its activity consists in impressing an idea upon matter. Therefore, it resides in the mind of the artifacts, or as they say, it is subject in that mind. It is certain of that mind. Two, the ancients applied the term habitus to qualities of a distinct and separate kind, essentially permanent conditions perfecting in the line of its own nature the subject they inform. Health and beauty are habitus of the body, sanctifying a grace, supernatural habitus of the soul. Other habitus have for subject the faculties or powers of the soul, and as these naturally tend to action, the habitus related to them perfect them in their very dynamism are operative habitus, such are the intellectual and moral virtues. <sighs> That's tough. Mm. Um, a little bit more. We acquired the last mentioned kind of habitus by exercise and customary use, but we must not therefore confuse habitus in the present technical sense with the modern meaning of habit, namely mere mechanical bent and routine. The two are utterly different and opposed. Customary habit, which attests the solid weight of matter, resides in the nerve centers. It's muscle memory. Operative habitus, which attests the activity of the mind, resides chiefly in an immaterial faculty only in the mind or the will. Yeah. Mm. Habitus are interior growths of spontaneous life, vital developments which make <laughs> the soul better in a given sphere and fill it full of vigorous sap. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, I think that spontaneity is always very important with the with the Thomistic view of virtue because a lot of people do think like morality is a set of rules to be applied externally. 
Uh, and there are unchanging moral truths, you know, but the fact is the moral virtues actually apply themselves in a fresh way in every situation. That's not situation <laughs> ethics. It's just the way that that virtue works. I'm just laughing at the Latin there. The Turgentia ubera animae. Ubera, ubera is Latin for teats. Mm. Oh, dear. Turgid. Teats of the spirit. Right. Carl, what did I tell you? What did I tell you? Don't talk like that. <laughs> what does Turgentia mean? Uh, sure. I, I'm Turgent? thinking it's like Folsom or something, but give me a moment and I'll 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 look it up with the power of the internet. The Folsom teats of the soul anime. <laughs> Swelling. <laughs> <laughs> I knew we were going to get here eventually. All right. It's me. It's Metropolis all over again. No, no, no. It's marvelous. Habitus, uh, which is plural in Latin, our interior growth of spontaneous life, vital developments make the soul better in a given sphere and fill it full of a vigorous sap, uh, fulsome teats of soul, as John of St. Thomas calls them. So you've got to translate the Latin. Yeah. You get this image. Here we are back on the farm, Thomas, <laughs> and you have the cow mm. with, its, with its Turgentia ubera. Yeah. Okay. Which shows you that this is not merely like an intellectual exercise or a logic thing. It's it's spurting out of you just like, you know, when Miles Davis comes to play and picks up his horn, it's not, well, this is what I played in my Arben book. You know, yes. it's this is what comes out. We call the virtues a second nature, like literally. <laughs> They're a second nature. Yeah. They actually develop and 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 alter you in your your substance. Yeah, and you're a better musician than I. You, you have the experience of the music has to come out. You have to play this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I, I have to leave this social situation. I got to go play piano for a while. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if you have that experience. And you don't know what you're going to play. And it comes out and it's good. And you're yeah. like, where did that come from? Especially because I'm an improviser. So I, my experience of that is is especially um, – not poignant. That's not the word I'm looking for. But it's it's especially I'm especially con uh, conscious of that aspect of it that that outflow aspect of it um, be because I am not I don't have the chance to sit and um, and reason it out in a discursive way. If you ever work with, well, sometimes you'll work with someone. I will work with someone doing whatever. We're going to put some fence in. We're going to build a greenhouse, whatever. And there are certain folks and you, you, you say, okay, we're going to do, we're going to work on this Thursday. And they show up and they're like, they know what to do. And they're like, let's go. And they drive the whole thing. And it's not that they're a slave driver and they're crapping, cracking the whip. They know what's next every time. And they're right there with the thing in their hand ready it's an intuition that is born of definitely of practice. You know, he wants to make a distinction between the sort of habit that we talk about nowadays and a ho habitus, but, the, but, mm -hmm. but you can't have the habitus without the practice, but they can comprehend the entirety of the job in their mind at one time with holding all of the pieces of the thing in their mind at the same time, they know what the right thing to do at the right time is. They know what's next. And not only that, but they want to do it and it's infectious. It's like, all right, man, let's yeah. go. And the job goes yeah. better. Not only does it go better, but it is better because that person is there. And there have been times when I was that guy and there have been times when somebody else was. And when you're that guy, you can feel it. And when somebody else is there, you, I can see it. And uh, you can't melt that and pour that on somebody. I don't know what it's born of, but I think that's the hobby too. Yeah. yeah, he says it's a metaphysical title of virtue. or t t Sorry, no, a metaphysical title of nobility. Yeah. So I was fascinated by this concept and, and wanted to figure out how to get it of interest perhaps is so habitus is not the same thing as English habit where you will find it being the same sort of thing is it is uh, when the nuns and the, the brothers and the monks used to wear these things, they call them habits. So when the young lady, you know, vows herself to the um, cloistered order and takes out the habit 
which mm. it refers to the clothing, but it means more than that. It means the habitus of being this particular vowed religious. So that gives you a different sense. Like your life is supposed to change. It's supposed to have this coming forth of, of, right. uh, of that kind of life. And so I wanted to know how you get it. And he, he gives some suggestions. He says it, it should be apprenticeship. And I know this is jumping. And if you want to come back, it's, I'm jumping 30 pages, but we can go back. So on page 42... He's crit- criticizing the academic, uh, the development of academic art quite a lot in this book. That's uh, that's actually like a major theme yeah. in this book, yeah. so far as his practical application is concerned. Yeah. Can you learn art from a book? No. No. I mean, precisely because, this is on page 42, precisely because art is a virtue of the practical intellect, the naturally appropriate method of teaching it is education by apprenticeship. A working novitiate, there's that word, novitiate, like a... You know, that young lady who took the habit, she goes through an avishit. Under a master and in face of reality, not lessons doled out by teachers, and in truth, the bare idea of an academy of fine arts, especially in the sense given to it by the modern state, is as stupid in conception as the idea of an advanced course of virtue. And I love that. I used to teach ethics courses, Mm. okay, because the university I was at required them. Nobody ever got more ethical from an ethics course. The very yeah. word ethics is somehow wobbly. <laughs> I don't know. See Our episode habits. on After Virtue by Alistair McIntyre. Yeah. Yeah, he says, yeah. a working novitiate under a master and in face of reality. <laughs> that, that's the key, man. So, you know, I can imagine if I really wanted to be Miles Davis without the drug problems, I, I probably got to join a combo. I probably got to be a working musician. And I have to have somebody in there who's better than me. It's always the best situation for me as a musician was being the worst guy in the group. Yeah. I think one of the things that's a little mysterious about what this habit is, is that like, okay, so it's not my physical technique. It's not my embouchure. You know, it, it's not, it might be something about knowing how to form an embouchure. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Mm-hmm. It, it, is it my knowledge of theory? Is that part of the habitus? Is my ear training, is ear training physical or is it that which the ear training achieves that's more than just being able to recognize a tone? You know, it, it's it's a little elusive, isn't it? Yeah, so we're using music as an example a lot. Yeah, because we're all musicians, so. Yeah. So what you do, dear listener, when you become a musician is you practice a lot and you practice boring stuff. You do scales, although I didn't find them that boring. I found them meditative. But you do all these things to get your, for trumpet, you get, to get your fingers to do the things and to get your face to be strong enough to do the things. Um, and, you know, I've got books of jazz licks that you practice in all 12 keys just so you have. Th- what, what you're trying to do, when Thomas mentioned connaturality, you're trying to make your nature mirror the nature of music itself so that when you go uh, and the big band stops and it's your turn to play the solo, you are connatural with the music. You're not thinking. Like Scott talked yeah. about the guy who shows up on the job and says, now this is what we do next. He's probably not thinking discursively. He's seeing what needs to happen. Charlie Parker said, you have to learn the chord changes and then forget them. Charlie Parker, yeah. as you don't know, great jazz sax player. Yes. I spent... Three days with a man of great hobby tooth a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I went to Greg Judy's grazing school in Rucker, Missouri. Greg Judy raises beef and sheep. I'm going to tear up. Uh, a lot of people would say, oh, I'm a rancher or I'm a farmer. He doesn't say that. He says, I'm a grazier. And he hmm. is. The humidity, the sun, the hour of the day. He apprehends all of that in terms of what that is going to do for his animals. He can't help it. Mm. I followed him around and watched him deal with these animals and teach and talk about it. And his whole being is tuned to taking care of these creatures. It's astounding. And, um, you know, and if he gets anything wrong, reality lets him know. (laughs) And, and through doing that, he, I think he's 61 and through doing that until he's in his seventh decade, like he is, he is a grazier. He doesn't act like one. 
He doesn't do it from nine to five. The guy is a grazier. And when he sees a problem, he knows what to do. And if he sees a problem that is new to him, he still knows what to do because he has an integrated view of how his action can affect animal husbandry. So when he says something new, he knows what to do. And even if that thing he does is ends up not being right, it was still the best thing for him to do at that time. I have no doubt that if facing a drought, yeah. a blizzard, grizzly bear attacks in the flock, like whatever, that he is best suited for dealing with that. Maritain talks about this infallibility, this infallible rectitude of art as far as like the formal aspect of it is concerned. It's you, you have a virtue. It's not going to go wrong. Yep. You know, there may be external conditions that cause a failure of some sort. Um, he talks about somebody who has the habitus of art and a trembling hand, and he might make an imperfect work, but he has a faultless virtue. It's the same with prudence. I, I don't claim to understand prudence too well, but, uh, you know, you can be very prudent and still make a, you know, make a mistake in the concrete circumstances, but that doesn't mean you don't have the virtue of prudence. Uh, that, that guy, that guy is super special. And when he, and when he, and when yeah. he stands up in front of everybody and starts talking, even if you don't care about that stuff, I think it would be complete. It would be completely obvious to anyone that he was super special. Uh, it, it, it was pretty yeah. stunning. It shows you, it's like a glimpse into the beauty of virtue. You know, it's not even a moral virtue, but it's still so beautiful. Um, and it's like you imagine, like, what if we had that with ev- – what if we all had that with everything? And it's like that's not possible in this life. But just imagine a human being who is such a master of himself in the world him- world around him. This is like, you know, pre-fall or something. Mm-hmm. Somebody who is so attuned to everything that's going on. That's the meaning of diversity right there is so that we can actually get a picture with all the different virtues that none of us has time to acquire all of in our lifetime. We can see that guy and look and see that's what mm-hmm. a perfect human like with this yeah. and this and what all these different people have put them together. And that's what a perfect human being would look like or something. I don't know. Yeah. Well, before we were rolling tape, we were talking about some television show and YouTube and all of that. One of the coolest things about YouTube is... I mean, there's so much, you know, there's a whole lot of bad stuff, but one of the cool things is watching people build stuff, watching art by Maritan's definition, making it's all art. Yeah. And it could be fine artists. You know, there's this, there's a guy that just, he has a a lathe and he just spins wood and carves it and completely useless things. And it's fascinating. Uh, So that would be more like a fine art. So he's just taking a U root and, and uh, polishing it just to see what it looks like. And it's beautiful and, and pointless. Or you can watch these people building houses, you know, people building cabins. I, I watched one, I don't know where they were from, Thailand or something. This this man and woman went out and built a, a two-level house out of bamboo. Yeah, I've seen it. It was just yeah. fascinating to watch them know exactly what to do. And they don't even talk, you know? And it's inspirational. I I really think this idea of the habitus of art is is very productive and motivating. It it makes me want to get good at stuff or talk to people who are good at stuff. Mm. Um, It's it's a revelation of being to get metaphysical, to hang out with people who know what they're doing. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I I felt that when, you know, Scott was describing this guy. I was, like, very moved by that. 